Hello, everybody. Welcome to the iSystem webinar, Introduction to Tracing. Today, we will give you an overview about how to use the hardware trace capabilities on your microcontroller, if there are any. My name is Errol. I'm the moderator. I will take your questions online or after the webinar, and uh, Felix will be the speaker, Felix, is a systems engineer um, with a lot of experience in with tracing, timing, analysis, and so forth. Uh, during the webinar, you will be muted, and questions can be placed by using the question writer. So using your keyboard, a handout is uploaded, so you can already download uh, the slides. The webinar will be recorded and will be published on the iSystem webinar channel. After the webinar, I will pick a couple of questions and uh, we will answer them live. And the rest of the questions will be answered by email after the webinar. So Felix, um, I guess you can start. Okay, thank you very much, Eero, for the nice introduction. Yeah, so we at iSystem, we like to keep it real. So, you know, like this is all nice and dandy, like those uh, photos, but, you know, I wanted to give you the real life shot. So that's how we're currently looking, right? Staying safe. So I hope hope everybody of you staying safe too. And we all hope that we can go back into full productivity soon. So let's talk about tracing today. So the reason why we decided to have this webinar is that we talk a lot about you know like advanced topics auto sub profiling analyzing the timing behavior and we realized that many engineers aren't even familiar with tracing like maybe they have heard about the general concept but then when we tell them that they have this powerful powerful capability then then they are surprised like what what use cases you can do with it, with it besides real-time analysis. So the idea of this webinar is really to start basic, like just give you a intuition about what a trace is and a trace event. And you should be able afterwards to name the different hardware trace techniques. So that means like what you can record inside your application. You will be able to record your first own hardware trace in WinIdea after this webinar. And then afterwards, you will be able to leverage that knowledge to become a more productive embedded software developer by using hardware tracing. So that's the idea. I also want to add a little disclaimer. So as I said, it's the purpose of this presentation is to give an introduction. So some of the use cases here may, may or may not be supported on all microcontrollers. So if you want to know if a specific feature that I mentioned today is available on your microcontroller, you have to either read the user manual or just contact us and ask us, okay? So um, be aware of this. Not everything that I show might work on your microcontroller. And then I just want to give a shout out to Slovenia, to our documentation team. Um, a couple of the nice graphics that you will see later on are uh, um, made by them and they have also created our really cool trace tutorial so if you have further questions after this webinar i recommend checking out this trace tutorial and yes thanks so much for the nice graphics all the good graphics are from them all the bad graphics i made myself that's the general rule of some here okay so let's get started um i want to give you an intuition about what a trace is and then give some example use cases. And the classic example use case is OS and RTE profiling, but there are a lot of other interesting ones. And I picked post-mortem analysis because I think that's a, that's a really cool use case. We will talk about trace techniques and hardware tracing in general, and we will talk about how to get trace data from a microcontroller that's called trace interfaces. And then finally, I will give uh, two demos for those example use cases in WinIdea. I don't know yet how much time we will have at the end, so I will scale it dynamically. If we have um, some time left, I will go into more detail. If we don't have so much time, I will just show you the basics. But you will at least have seen a full configuration in WinIdea for both of these use cases at the end of this presentation. 
So what is a trace? Uh, I like to define a trace as a list of events, of trace events, and they are ordered by timestamp. So an event is really anything that is like going on inside your application. And whatever is going on is then, then gets a timestamp and is put into a list of events. And that list of events is a trace, okay? So what are examples for events? So the most obvious ones are instructions. So code, things that are happening with the code, like a call instruction of a certain function, a jump, a conditional jump, a branch, or a return from a function, right? Like a call could be a function entry, return is a function exit, and then you might have a loop or if instructions and so on. So that's the code level. Then secondly, memory write and read accesses. So you might have a write to a certain variable and you might be interested in the value that is written to the variable, that would be a data event. Okay, so that's a memory read write. And then we also have uh, really anything that's going on in the application, right? So you could have, you could do direct memory accesses. So you might want to know when the DMA started and finished. You might use RTE communication. Then you might be interested when is a certain RTE message sent or received. You might be interested in like what your CAN network is doing. So you can record CAN messages, and we actually have a add-on module that can do exactly that. Or you might be interested in external I/O events, so you might record pins next to your program flow trace. Okay, so all those events that are going on inside your application, those are added with timestamps, annotated with timestamps, and then written into a trace. And the nice thing about that is that in contrast to debugging, in order to record a trace, you don't have to interrupt the runtime behavior of the application. So that's the idea of a trace. You really record information and then you analyze them as shown here. And we will see a bigger screenshot later or when we go into Vinity, you will see this and bigger. So we have this code area, the data area and the auxiliary area that I just mentioned here. So let's look at an example. So yeah, here again, Tracing provides really an in-depth view into the dynamic behavior of an application, right? That's important. It's dynamic. You don't have to, to stop your system. So, yeah, let's look at this really complex code here. <laughs> it's just an example. So we are calculating some Fibonacci number here. And in our main, main routine, we call that function. We want to get the, the third Fibonacci number. And uh, let's see how that maps to tracing. So we might be interested in uh, function entries and exits. Okay, so those could be function events here, like when the function is called, and then we have a sub function here, and then we return. So those are function events. But we also might be interested in, in memory writes. And you see here, A and B are actually global variables. Uh, usually, if you record data trace, you want to you can only record variables that are in global memory that have a um, fixed symbol. If you would want to record variables that are on the stack, uh, that's much more trickier and usually not feasible. So that's why I made A and B global here. But yeah, you might be interested in the write and read accesses to those to those uh, variable variables. And then, so the first step is to then tell the microcontroller that you're interested in those informations and that step is actually called tracing so you tell the microcontroller this is what i'm interested in and then you record a trace and you get something like this so this is a raw trace output in winidea and maybe you recognize the colors here the orange uh, boxes are the function events so here like this get and Fibonacci is called, and then that calls the add function, and the add function exits, and then since we call it with three, it's called multiple times here, right? And then eventually the get and Fibonacci exits. I want to mention entry and exits are examples, but the debugger actually also sees the for loop in between and potential if else if statements and other conditional jumps. So we don't only get the function entries and exits, but really all assembly instructions that are being executed. 
And then, of course, you can also see the memory um, read and write accesses here. In this case, I have just the write accesses. So you see the symbol um, that is written to yeah, the, the address at which it's located, and then the value that is written into it. And then, yeah, if you're familiar, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, that's how a Fibonacci series should grow. So it all makes sense. Should should be uh, pretty clear. So that step, again, is called tracing. That's when you tell the microcontroller what you want to record on the hardware and then gather that data with the, with the debugger. And that will be important later to, to understand that uh, trace step. So once we have the data, once we have this list of events, um, what do we do now? And now we want to represent it in a way that is um, easier to understand for, for humans. And that's what the profiler timeline is for. So here in the profiler timeline, again, um, you have, and yeah, this step is called profiling. So going from the raw trace data, from the raw trace events to a more human-friendly pres presentation, we call that profiling in our tool. And here, then you can see the code area where we have the main function and the main function is it's doing its thing. And then some point it calls get ends Fibonacci. So we have the function entry here and then it calls add a couple of times and returns uh, eventually. And then the same thing is true for the memory write and reads. Okay, so that's the basic idea. We want to record those events. And as I mentioned here, I haven't pointed out that column yet. Each of those events has a timestamp. And that timestamp allows us to plot those events graphically over time. That should make sense now. So what can you do uh, with this capability? So the classic example is actually operating system and RTE profiling. So you might be interested in the runnable entry exit um, events. You might be interested to um, understand like how much um, runtime your runnables consume. You might be interested in task states. So there you events would be task activate, task running, task suspended, task waiting. And you might be interested when you're in, in, in when your ISRs are started and stopped. So that's the OS profiling use case. And again, you will might recognize the colors by now. The red one, that's the program flow trace. So the runnable entries and access can, um, can be recorded with this orange code messages. And then the task events can be recorded with, with data tracing. So that's why it's blue here. So that's one use case. But really, like once you have this capability, you can debug any issue that you want. So another example is, and you see I have a really nice slide here, is post-mortem analysis. So the idea of post-mortem analysis would be, let's say you have a really tricky bug in your application, like you only go into an exception sporadically and you want to understand why that happens. And it's really hard to debug that issue because you don't know when it, what, when it happens. So there the idea would be you just start a trace recording, you just start a program flow trace recording, you just record those code messages. And then whenever the condition, like whenever your bug is hit, the trace recording stops and you can then analyze the trace to understand what happens. So that would be a more advanced use case of tracing, and I will give an example for that later in Vinidia. So now the question is, how do we actually gather that data? Like, how do we do the trace step, recording the raw events, and how do we then analyze them? So in general, there are two techniques, two main techniques for recording trace events. The first, uh, first one is software tracing. Software tracing means that you generate the trace messages in software. So you add instrumentation to the code, you buffer the events that you create in memory, and then you send them off chip or you read them from the microcontroller in some way or in another. Classically, um, application interfaces such as CAN or Ethernet are used. And the advantage of software tracing is you don't need any special hardware, right? You probably already have like some kind of application interface anyway, and you don't need you don't need a debugger, you don't need the trace capabilities. You can just instrument your code and block the events and send them out. The disadvantage, of course, is you create overhead, right? You create a significant overhead by adding that instrumentation. 
you can, because of that overhead, you cannot record as much as you want because uh, the more objects you record, the bigger the overhead gets. And also it creates a load on those application interfaces that you're using to send the data off chip. On the other hand, hardware tracing works by using a dedicated on-chip trace logic. So you have a part on the silicon that is responsible for recording trace data. And then that silicon, that dedicated part on the silicon sends the data off chip either via a dedicated trace interface or just via the regular debug, debug interface like JTAG. And we will talk about the difference between those two on, on a later slide. And then the nice thing, of course, about hardware tracing is that you don't generate any overheads and you can do a couple of really advanced use cases like those post this post-motem analysis that I mentioned. You couldn't really do that with software tracing because let's say your application goes into an exception and or into an error loop or whatever, then you cannot send the data off chip anymore via via dedicated inter or via the application interface. But if that happens with hardware tracing, you will still be able to uh, record the events that are going on. So hardware tracing really uh, allows for this more powerful use cases. The disadvantage, of course, is you need this dedicated on-chip trace logic. If you don't have that available, then you can't do hardware tracing. So let's take a closer look at hardware tracing because, of course, it's the, f the favorite technique that we want to util utilize if possible. So here we have your target with your microcontroller, the blue box connected to the microcontroller, and then, of course, win idea running on your host computer. And on the target, there are the different CPU cores and the buses in between. And then this part here, that's the actual on-chip trace logic. So you see there's one building block for program trace. That's for recording those orange code instructions that we have seen earlier. Then there's one for data trace. So that's for recording those uh, read and write accesses. And then there's also instrumentation trace, which uh, is a special technique where you add a little bit of instrumentation actually to your application and then uh, it generates trace messages for you. So I don't want to talk about instrumentation trace in too much detail now. So if we focus on program trace and data trace, those two building blocks internally have a logic that allows you to define what you want to record. So for example, you could record a full program flow trace. So you tell the trace logic, okay, whatever instruction is executed, I want to record that. And that's not like really what happens on a microcontroller. There's always some kind of, um, of compression going on. It's called the uh, con um, like only the, the, the jump and the branch um, instructions are actually recorded. But you could also say, I only want to record program flow messages when the application is inside a certain memory range, like uh, in, inside a certain range in the, in the program flash. Only those instructions should be um, recorded. And the same is true for data trace. You could say, I want to record all um, write accesses to memory, but usually that would be too many messages. So you can use a filter here and say, okay, I only want to trace write accesses to a certain variable. And then for whatever you configure here, uh, trace messages are generated. They are sent off chip. If you have a dedicated trace on interface, they are sent off chip. Or if you're using a debug interface, they're usually buffered. And we will talk about that more on the next slide. They are buffered and then sent uh, and then read off the microcontroller by the debugger. And of course, you need to add a timestamp at some point. We mentioned earlier that that is really important. So depending on the microcontroller you're using, the timestamp is either timestamp generation is either done on the microcontroller itself or is done by the blue box. And then you can do the profiling in WinIdea. So let's talk about how to get the trace data off chip. Okay, so you have the dedicated trace logic on the silicon, and now the debugger has to record, like gather that data. And there are two ways for doing it. And I want to start with the picture on the bottom. And here we have a classical debug setup. We have a debug port like JTAG. And 
JTAG is not a streaming interface. That means every request to the microcontroller has to be initi initiated by the debugger. And so to record traces in, the, in, these, in this case, the microcontroller has to buffer the trace messages in a dedicated uh, trace buffer. So it's usually called OCDB on chip trace buffer. So the trace messages are stored into the buffer and then the debugger reads out the data. That's um, the first technique. And the second technique is a dedicated trace port. So a trace port is actually usual, uh, usually a serial or a parallel interface where the trace logic directly streams the data into the trace port and the trace port sends out the, the data like, like, a, like a streaming interface. And then the debugger automatically receives those messages that, that are streamed out and buffers it um, in its own internal buffer and then they are forwarded to the host PC. So those are the main, main techniques. And of course, the advantage of having a potentially a high-speed serial interface is that you can record much more data. But even with, on, with an on-chip trace buffer, depending on the microcontroller you're using, you might actually be able to record large um, amounts of data. So you cannot necessarily say that one is better to the other than the other. Those are just the general techniques that are available. Okay. So by now you understand, okay, I need this trace logic on my microcontroller and I need a debug or a trace port that allows me to get that um, data off the chip. So let's look at an, an example. Um, I have picked out a chorus for, um, or like the, the chorus series, like the PowerPC um, ST microcontrollers. And here you can kind of uh, see what I've just explained. So um, I want to point out this ETB, that's the embedded trace buffer. And you can see the different derivatives here. And then you can see the different package sizes. And then for each of those package uh, sizes, um, the slide shows you whether trace via a um, streaming interface is available. So that would be here if this um, trace box is filled out or if an on-chip trace buffer is available. And okay, so now if you have a certain microcontroller, uh, let's say you have this chorus 2M and then you um, know, okay, I have one of those packages here and then you look here and then you see, okay, oh, I don't have trace. I don't, there's no streaming interface. And there's also um, no on-chip trace buffer. So you're out of luck. Or maybe you actually have a chorus 6M uh, like with a bigger package and then you see, oh, I have uh, Aurora trace capabilities. I I can use tracing. Okay, so uh, the purpose of the slide is um, just to show it's not easy to answer if you have trace available or not. In general, you really have to look which derivative are you using, and then check out the user manual or ask us, and then we will be able to assist you. So if you have one of those emulation devices here that have the powerful trace capabilities, that's great, but. <laughs> What if you actually realize that you don't have trace available? Um, you know, you get you got all excited. Um, this tracing is great. I want to do it, but your microcontroller does not have trace available. What do you do then? And uh, luckily, there is a solution for that, and that's called emulation adapters. And the idea of emulation adapters is. As you could see in the previous slide, for most of the derivatives, there's a bigger package that provides trace capabilities. So what you can do is you can remove the microcontroller from your from your target, from your PCB, and then you put a soldering unit onto your target, and then on top of that soldering unit, you attach such an emulation adapter. And for some microcontrollers, we provide this um, emulation adapters for other microcontrollers our tool partners or the silicon vendors like Infineon, Renesis and so on provide the emulation adapters. And the idea then is that once you attach that emulation adapter, you have a bigger package of the same microcontroller that you're using. So you can run your application except, exactly the same way as before. But in addition to that, the trace device, that dedicated trace area on the silicon is available. Plus, we also make the dedicated trace port available and you get full trace capabilities. Okay, so that's the idea of an emulation adapter. 
even if you don't have uh, tracing available right away, there might be a way to get it. So don't be too sad if you find out that your microcontroller doesn't support trace, at least the, the reviewer that you're using. Maybe it already does, then it's great. All right, so by now you should have a general understanding, actually a pretty, pretty detailed understanding of what tracing is, right? We want to record those events that are interested for the, for the timing analysis or for debugging, we want to record the events with a timestamp. Um, you understand what capabilities your microcontroller has to have uh, for, for you to be able to record those trace events. And you also understand that you have a daddy, that you need one of those trace interfaces available uh, in order to record the data. So let's assume you have that. So you have your working PC, you have a debugger, potentially active probe, and you have a target that supports trace. Now what I want to show you in the, let's say maybe last 10, 10 or 15 minutes or so, I want to show you two examples for how that actually looks like. So the first example is on a Chorus 4M, so the microcontroller that I just showed on the previous slides. It's running uh, ETA's RTA operating system, so Autos operating system. And I just want to show you the Hello World running task, uh, running ISR profiling use case. And whenever I start um, to record traces with customers, running task, running ISR profiling is what I do first because it's just really easy to set up usually. And once that works, we can move on to more advanced use cases, but it's really what I call the hello world of tracing. So let's see how that looks like in WinIdea. So this is my workspace here. Let's see, um, let's initialize this. So yeah, as I said, that's a, that's a PowerPC based application. I won't go into the details of um, how to, how to um, like configure the trace. Uh, let's just go ahead and run the application here. And then, of course, because I'm doing it live, it's, it's not working right away. Just give me a second. I'm just struggling a little bit because I can't see the status of, okay, now I moved that window out of the way. And let's see if we can run that. Okay, so now our application is running fine. So you can see some of the task states here are changing. So let's say um, you have your, hardware setup running, like your application is running, your debugger is working, you can set breakpoints and so on, you can debug. So now um, what do you have to do to actually start to record a trace? So the first thing in this example, I want to record a running task, running ISR trace. So under debug operating system, I actually added a so-called RT file for operating system profiling. If you don't know what that means, it doesn't matter. There's another webinar about specifically about auto -sub profiling. Just wanted to mention for completeness sake here. So we have the RT file configured here. And then we, the first thing we have to do in order to record traces, WinIdea has a dedicated view called the WinIdea Analyzer. So if you go to view analyzer, you can open it. And in my case, you can already see, I have already opened it here. So let's close it so that you get the idea. So we open the analyzer here and then let's tap it in here. Oops. Okay. Make it a little bit bigger. So that's the analyzer. And I, I briefly want to um, explain what you see here. So up here, you can have a list of uh, different uh, trace configurations. So if you click the hammer, you open the, the configuration that is currently active. And if you um, select the dropdown, you can create a new configuration or choose one of the existing ones. I recommend always um, creating a new configuration. You don't want to use uh, the default one. Like you can use the default one to just do a test, but then you um, want to create your own configurations. 
And then um, we have a couple of different views here. So trace is the view that shows the raw trace data. Then the profiler timeline is what we have seen before, where you can see the events over time. And then there are statistics, and we will take a look at the statistics too. And then one thing that I haven't mentioned yet, and that I won't discuss in detail in, in this presentation is, there's also uh, a coverage, a code coverage view. So what you can do based on program flow trace, you can actually do code coverage analysis because you have the instructions that the microcontroller has executed over the duration of the trace recording that allows you to, to do code coverage analysis. And we can do this here in the analyzer, but I won't show it in, in this presentation. Okay, so let's go ahead. And um, in this example, we wanted to do the OS profiling. So I create a new configuration. I call it OS running task. ISR because that's what we want to record. And you can see there are a couple of different options here, like how I can configure my trace. And, and we can also select the kind of analysis that we want to do. In this case, we want to use the profiler, no code coverage. And I actually set automate, uh, automatic hardware trigger configuration here. And so let's do that. And now, if you remember earlier, on one of the slides I showed you, tracing is a kind of a two-step process, process, right? First, you tell the microcontroller what you want to record, and then you tell the profiler how you want to visualize, how you want to analyze that data. And you can see this distinction exactly here, like there's a hardware tab where you tell them, can tell the microcontroller what exactly you want to record, and then there's a profiler tab where you um, tell WinIdea, the analyzer, how to visualize that data. And in this case, the hardware configuration, I, don't, I don't have manual trigger configuration selected here, which means that WinIdea will try to do the configuration for me. And that's exactly what I want to show you first. Um, so we go to the profiler, and I don't want to record program flow trace, so I don't want to record code for now. I don't want to record data, but I'm interested in my OS app objects. And so let's configure that. And here you can see I have the task and the ISRs for the two cores selected. So those looks all nice and fine. So again, here I tell the profiler how to interpret the, the raw data, the raw events that come from the, from the chip. And I tell it, okay, please do my OS um, profiling analysis for that. And because I don't have the manual trigger configuration selected here, WinIdea will try to do that automatically for me. So let's see how that works. So I've created a new configuration and you can see here OS running task ISR is active. And now if I start the trace, the trace recording has begun and you can see down here in the lower right corner that we are recording events, we are sampling. You can see here in the profiler timeline that uh, the time is increasing, so we're still recording. And then here in the data area, you can see the different tasks and ISRs. And this is a really simple example application, as you can see, uh, but we can actually see that um, all the tasks and ISRs are executed over time and let me just stop the trace here so that it doesn't become too much data and uh, so now you can go uh, look into the trace and you see like what of your ta which of your tasks are running over time and do whatever analysis you want to do i want to point out this is even though you see tasks and ISRs under the hood, this is really a data trace. The operating system has a so-called running task and a so-called running ISR variable. And all the profiler does here is analyzing the right accesses to those two variables to show us this nice task, this nice task ISR view. Okay, so that's the profiler timeline view. Um, we could, of course, also look at the raw events. So um here you see the raw events and if i click here then you can see that actually like if i select a certain event um, those two perspectives are synchronized and it shows me okay like really my task extend one that this is executed here is just a right access to a certain address 
with a certain value. Okay, that's the raw event, uh, that's the trace event we have recorded, and then in the profiling step, it gets um, transformed in this more humanly understandable, uh, understandable form. So that's the raw trace output. And then one more thing I want to show here is the statistics view. So if we are now a, uh, interested in like the CPU load, for example, we could um, check out the statistics view. And if I do a right click here, you can see there are a couple of different metrics available. Uh, the net execution time gives us the information like how long for how long a certain task is actually actively running inside the application. And then here you can see um, for what amount, so we have recorded for 38 seconds in total, and then for 19 seconds out of those 38, this task low priority has been executed and that, that amounts to a load of about 50%. And now if we are interested in the CPU load as a whole, there's like no direct way to view it, but we have an idle task here. So if we take the net execution time by the idle task, if the idle task is active for 44% of the time, that means our load, like the application is doing something for 100% minus those 44. So that means our CPU load is about 56% in that case, okay? So that's just um, an, uh, a really um, um, quick view into the into the um, metrics that are available here. There are a lot of other metrics, and you could also analyze the ISRs. Uh, and uh, in this case, there's no ISRs in core one apparently, but there are on core zero. And uh, so, so you get the idea of this uh, statistics view. So that's example one. Hope that all makes sense really get the idea i don't i haven't talked about the colors colors here but i think it's um pretty self-explanatory hopefully red shows that a certain object is actively running on the core uh, green shows also here that the idle core the idle task is um, active green is just a special color for the idle object and then if there's a blue um, a hint of blue, that means that there's more stuff going on here, so we have to zoom in. And then you can see the task is running, it's red, and then the slight red or maybe pink color shows us that the task has been uh, preempted, in this case, by an ISR. So that's what the light red color means. Felix, mm -hmm. can I uh, interrupt you for a second? There was sure. a quite interesting question about uh, this unknown core. Um, um, what what does it mean? So, um, no, I mean that's a that's in totally a profiler good, timeline. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a totally good uh, and valid question. So, <laughs> the idea of unknown cores, if win idea doesn't know yet what task is running on a certain core, so if we start the trace recording. We don't have any information about the value of the running ISR and the running task vari variable yet, right? So we start the we start the trace recording, and so Winadia knows that the trace is started because there are events coming in. So for example, here there are events coming for the ISR, but there hasn't been a right access to the running task variable yet, and that's when Winadia shows us shows us unknown unknown core. So unknown core is when we don't have information yet about the task that is currently running, then it's unknown. And unknown should really only be there at the beginning. And then if we scroll further to the right, unknown should no longer be hap um, occur here. So yeah, really good question. That's, that's the background of unknown here. And the idea is, in general, it's only active for such a short amount of time relatively to the whole trace duration that you can ignore it for the timing analysis. All right. Thanks for that question. Let's go back to the presentation. All right, so that was the hello world of, um, of tracing and profiling running tasks ISR. And now the second example I want to show and I will, excuse me, I will use about 
yeah, let's say five more minutes for that, is the post-mortem debugging. So this is running on a second generation Oryx, and it's a bare, our bare metal testing Hello World example application. So there's no um, operating system running here. So let me open this workspace, and now I have to quickly re-plug my debuggers here. And uh, let's see if I can do a download here. So the purpose of this example is to show program flow trace and then show the advantages of this post-mortem use case compared to, to regular program flow trace. So let's go ahead and uh, run this, check the watches. So our counters are incrementing, everything looks good. So again, if we want to record a trace, we go to view, Analyzer. Maybe I should mention for complete for completeness sake, there are some other options that you might want have to set up before you can use the trace. Usually the default is fine, but um, if you go to hardware setup and then analyzer, this is where you actually record the trace. And here in this example, I'm using on-chip trace actually. I have the Aurora trace port available on the microcontroller that I'm using, but in this case, I'm actually just using the DAP interface for the tricorp with on-chip trace. So this is where you, where you can configure the, the analyzer. And if you were using Aurora, there's a second, so that's the high-speed serial interface for Oryx. There's another tab for that. Um, as I said, in general, the default configuration is usually um, okay. Um, so I just wanted want to mention it here. Uh, so with that out of the way, let's go ahead, view analyzer. And again, I like to drag and drop it up here. So that's nice and in the middle. And the first thing I want to show is, um, let's create a new configuration again, and let's do a program flow trace uh, this time. And so I do call it program flow automatic. Uh, I use, you, you can see there are different uh, ways to create the configuration here. You can do it fully by yourself, then you select manual. Um, there's also wizards that help you to create a configuration. I use the automatic one again. And then you can see the manual trigger configuration is unselected. And then on profiler, I just do code analysis. So in this case, I want to record program flow trace. And let's see how that works. And you can see we have recorded some data. And the first thing that, um, that you will notice is that the trace has been recorded for only for a short time. And that's because we are doing an on-chip trace now. On the, on the other, on the PowerPC, we were actually using the Nexus trace interface, which is a parallel streaming interface, a dedicated trace port. Here we are just using the regular DAP debug interface. So we are just tracing inside the on-chip, into the on-chip trace buffer. And then we, once that buffer is full, the microcontroller tells us, okay, I can no longer trace. We read out the data. And that's the reason why the trace is shorter. So uh, again, we have the raw trace data here. So this time, of course, it looks different. This time we don't have the, those data events, but we have actual instructions event, events. So there are move instructions, jump instructions, um, function entries and exits and so on, all with a timestamp, you get the idea. And then, of course, we have the same in the trace um, itself. And so we have our main routine up here, and then um, it executes different functions. So now, um, what if something bad happens? So what if I um, get an error? And you can see, I like for some reason, an error has occurred, and I have ended up in the error handler unexpectedly. The, I, I end up in this error handler and I don't really know what has happened. Um, I could actually go uh, ahead and run the application and you can still see my interrupts still work fine, but for some reason my, my application ended up in this error. And now if I want to debug that, um, I cannot utilize, really utilize program flow trace because if it happens only sporadically and I can only record for 30 milliseconds, 
then um, I won't be able to catch that moment in time when the error actually occurred. So this is where post-mortem analysis becomes um, interesting. So let's reset our microcontroller here. And then uh, let's go ahead and run it. Make sure it's running okay. And what I want to show you now is I switch, and I in this case, the post-mortem analysis, I have prepared the configuration. And I can actually show you why. Uh, because if I open the configuration by clicking on the hammer, then you can see in this case, I have actually done the configuration manually. And I won't explain it in detail. I just want to mention like this post-mortem analysis is not something that uh, that Vinetia can do by itself. I actually had to configure that configuration. I had to do that configuration manually. And now what I can do is I can start the trace. And you can see we are not actually recording yet. Vinadio shows us waiting here. And what's happening right now is the microcontroller is using the on-chip buffer in, like in a circular way. So it's continuously recording program flow information in that internal buffer. And now what I can do is if I stop the microcontroller manually, then the trace also stops and Vinadia shows me all the data uh, that has been going on before I manually stop the microcontroller. So what I can do now is I can actually go ahead, run the target, run the trace, we go back to waiting. And then I also just set, simply set a breakpoint in my, in my arrow function like this. And now I can go do something else. I can have that running on my test stand overnight. You know, like if the error only occur occurs one in once in three hours, I can just keep win idea running here. But I know whenever my error finally occurs, I will end up in that error handler. The breakpoint will be hit. The trace recording stops. And I, when I come back the next morning, I, I, um, I get my data and I can analyze what, what's been happening. So let's just hope that the error occurs here. Oh, there, there it was, the error has occurred. We've hit the breakpoint. And now if we go to the analyzer view, um, again, we have some data. We have the last 30 milliseconds of program flow execution before the error has occurred. And now I can go to the end of my trace here, um, zoom in a little bit and then maybe set a marker and you can actually sort the events by time here it's a little bit hidden but there is actually an error here and so you can see i can kind of sort by what has happened before that point in time and now um, if i look at that okay my main function has been executed and then there's this type function pointer and of course function point already um star sounds a little bit weird like of course um, this is just an example application you should never ever use function pointers in an embedded safety critical systems uh, but we can see apparently like this function was still executed and then something went wrong so we already get some idea about uh, about where the error has occurred so we could start it we could start debugging in that function um, or we could also look um, at the raw trace. And again, those events are synchronized. So if I click here, then I can see, okay, my last event was actually the error handler. That makes sense. That's what I expect. And then before that, I can look a little bit, okay, there is some call here. So it seems like, and I actually, I double clicked on the event here and then Vinadio shows me that event in the source code. And then I can see, okay, there's some function that is called via a global function pointer. So now I know, okay, probably something, somehow that function pointer got corrupted, pointed to an invalid memory address. And uh, that's why I ended up in my error loop. Um, you get the idea. It's a little bit a stupid ex example. Um, you, of course, you shouldn't use a function pointer, but maybe, you know, there are, there are some um, occurrences where you have um, uh, 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 array access that is out of out of bounds, like some, somehow your array boundaries get corrupted. And then you have an invalid access to RAM, yeah, right? 
you would still be able to detect that with the same, same analysis technique, right? You would run your application and then after three hours, you have an access to an invalid memory area, you hit your breakpoint in your error handler, and then you would be able to analyze what has caused that access to an invalid memory region. And that's the idea of, of post-mortem analysis. And then, of course, those were just two examples that I showed here today. You can really, you can record all the variables, all the functions that you're interested in. And um, I think I have proven that this is a powerful way to debug your system and get deeper insights. And uh, Felix, think, yeah? for a proper ending of your demonstration, uh, could you yeah. explain the red bar uh, in WinIdea uh, on the top? Oh yeah, I'm, so um, yeah. Actually, this is I want. I had this on my list to point this out. So what we can see here in the in the um, profiler timeline um, is actually. So I have this. Let's take this get and Fibonacci function, and uh, let's zoom in here a little bit into this function. So for example, here. Wait, I can actually zoom in a little bit further. And what you can see here in the code area, and this is a fairly new feature, is um, in the past we had the issue that if you have, like this is an example application with, um, you know, like 30 functions or whatnot. But let's say you have a real project with 1,000 functions. You can imagine that this view gets a little bit cluttered and, 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 and hard to keep um, the overview about what's going on so of course you can use the filter to only filter for certain items but it would be really nice to understand what's going inside a certain function and you can actually do that so if you want to see what's going on inside this get and fibonacci function we can open that here and uh, then Vinadia shows us, oh, Ens Fibonacci is actually called inside two different contexts, one inside the main function and two also into type function pointer. And then we can further expand it and say, okay, what's going on when it's called from inside the main function? And we open that and then we, then we see, oh, okay, it uh, calls the add function here three times and then it returns. So this is a new feature that we call, um, oh, it's not here right now, um, we call it call stack profiling. And call stack profiling is still in an experimental state. And I wanted to show it in this demo. And that's why we have this red bar here. I'm kind of in a test mode where I have this call stack profiling enabled. And that's the reason why you see the red bar here. And um, we are currently in the process of um, reviewing and uh, testing that call stack profiling function. And then in one of the future releases, you will have that feature available without that red bar. Uh, so I hope that answers your question, Aero. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we we took longer than expected, so I, I guess we should maybe not do too many questions. So. So you're done. I'm I'm finished. Yeah. Thank you very much for for your attention. Uh, questions at webinar at iSystem.com. You have the presentation available. I think you can uh, download it from the GoToMeeting. And yeah, I'm, I'm done. OK, there. Thank you very much, Felix, for this uh, overview and uh, some examples. Um, there were many questions, so let's go through some of them. Um, for example, does tracing work with hot attach, meaning tracing while hardware is running without performing a reset? Yes. Yeah. You can. You can hot attach, and then. And so this is actually one of the questions where it depends a little bit on the microcontroller. But for most microcontrollers, you can hot attach. The debugger can configure the trace logic on the fly without resetting, and then you can record a trace. So I, I, I would say in most cases the answer is yes. Okay. Um, is it? possible to specify some conditions about tasks that for example a task must be activated after a previous task was finished within a time frame of 5 milliseconds yeah i that's that's a really that's a really good question and that's um that's actually where the if we go back to the example here if um 
so this is not a question about the hardware trace recording part, but more about the like what kind of analysis can you do. So once you have the profiler timeline data with all the events, once you have all that data available, you can really do a lot of different types of analysis. So if you want to check that a task is activated, I don't know, like often enough, or that the net execution time does not exceed a certain value, you can certainly do that based on that data uh, here. And we have actually, we have a feature called um, profiler inspectors, and I uh, don't want to explain them in too much detail here, but those profile inspectors allow you what you ask to do. So you can check is a task um, executed like within a certain um, re um, 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 period, for example, or like does the net execution have not exceed a certain value? Like you can do that kind of analysis and you do that in the profiling steps. So on the, on the high level here, uh, inside Vinadia. But yeah, really good good question. Uh, coming back to the emulation adapter, uh, when using an emulation adapter, does the target hardware require kind of rewiring to match the layout of the adapter? Uh, no, actually the idea of the adapter is that the lower part of the adapter here that you attach to that soldering unit that you put onto the onto the onto your target board that has the same pin out the same amount of pins that your original microcontroller also has so all you have to do is and like that simply I, I make it simpler than it is in reality probably all you have to do is you desolder the microcontroller that is on your target you attach the soldering unit and like you saw, you solder the soldering unit onto the target and then you attach the adapter. You don't have to change any other wiring besides that. Um, I'm thinking maybe like depending on how the oscillator is wired, usually not, usually can use um, jumpers here on the emulation adapter to make sure that the right os oscillator is used. Um, so I would say the answer is no. You actually, besides uh, removing the microcontroller and doing the, the soldering, uh, you don't have to make any changes to the PCB itself. That's the idea of that emulation adapter. Okay. Another question is about... Um... So is it only possible to trace data accesses in the, in RAM or uh, in the whole memory address space? Uh, that's that's a good question. That um, is microcontroller specific again. So it uh, depends on the on the hardware memory layout of the microcontroller on and on the trace device. In general, I would say. For for most microcontrollers, it's um, actually like you could you could also um, record events to um, like accesses to flash memory. I would say like if it's like it really depends on the microcontroller, but I I I would say uh, how to answer it in a concise way. No, you're not you're not limit not, not limited to the RAM only. Depending on the microcontroller, you can access other other areas too other memory areas. Then uh, there are a couple of questions about slow run mode, slow, yeah, debugging. Um, could you spend a word on that? I mean, is it a poor man's trace? Yeah, exactly. So I actually, I actually didn't mention it in, uh, during my presentation. I just have it here on the slide. So if you don't have trace available, there is an alternative called slow run. And the idea of slow run is that the debugger single steps through the application and uh, automatically, and then records all the instructions that are being executed. So, and by that means you can kind of record a poor man's trace. And I, I it is, um, it, it it is a possibility. Like if you want to get code coverage, for example, you could use that slow run capability of Winadia. The problem is that you don't have any real time behavior whatsoever, right? Because you're stepping through the application. So um, for most real world use cases, it's 
probably not feasible if you just want to analyze a simple like a single function isolated it might work but in general it's really a a, a poor poor man's uh, trace um it is it is available but i i you you actually can't compare slow run to real trace capabilities i, I would even say that the use cases uh, are different mm -hmm. maybe a final question um if i get a trace overflow what should i do <laughs> uh, that's a good a very good question um you you somehow like at first you want to make sure that you're maximizing the um trace speed of the of the trace interface that uh, you are using so um make sure that you're using the highest feasible clock rate and the highest clock rate might depend on your pcb and the length of your cables and so on so you first want to ma maximize that if you're still getting overflows, then you have to create a manual hardware um, trace configuration, and you have to tell those uh, this program trace and the data trace unit to record more limited data. Like if you're getting overflows, that just means you get like too many events are being generated, and uh, either the bottleneck is usually um, here. On the, on the microcontroller, like the microcontroller cannot send out the data fast enough. So you have to decrease the data generation rate. You have to record less events, and then hopefully that um, that should resolve the, the, the overflow issue. But yeah, really, really a, a good question and, and, and a common issue, unfortunately. Okay, thank you, Felix. I think uh, we are now running out of time, one hour uh, tracing. We have still some open questions, Felix. I'm 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 sure you will answer them uh, quickly um, by email, and uh, maybe you can show me the last slide again, if there is one, with uh, this, this. a couple of links. I think these these are also part of the PDF file, so you can uh, visit uh, these websites and also the tutorial, and. Um, learn more about tracing we will run a couple of other trace related webinars uh, next week with, uh, with the itas uh, autos operating system and then in june with vector microsar so uh, stay tuned and uh, we are happy to welcome you again okay thank you for attending yeah thank you very much uh, thanks for listening in and yeah um as i said this, this was an introduction if you if you have more specific questions then uh, our support and our FAEs and system engineers will be happy to assist you. Okay, thank you very much again and take care. See you bye soon bye. again. Bye bye.